We are counting down 10 board games that captured our attention this month at Watch It Played and discussing why each one caught our eye. This is On The Radar. Hi, I'm Paula Deming and we have a batch of games to share with you, starting with a new twist on an old favorite that Monique and Naveen recently revisited, Patchwork, in which two players compete to assemble the most aesthetic and high-scoring quilt on a personal 9x9 game board. As the game progresses, players will add available patches to their quality quilt and earn buttons, which are the game's currency. At the end of the game, players earn points for the buttons they have accumulated, but also lose points for any spaces on their fabric masterpiece left unstitched. Not only are we big fans of the original patchwork, but we also love all the holiday variations. Yeah, of course, like the uh, Christmas edition. Halloween. And now this Valentine's edition. In fact, we think that holiday themed variations is a trend that more games should follow. Which is why we are pitching an Arbor Day version of Bosk to its publishers. And in this version, you get to play as trees. Uh, but you already play as trees in the regular version of the game. Exactly. No expensive redesign for this Arbor Day edition. Potentially saving millions on production costs. Huh. This game variation may be the smartest idea I've ever heard. What about my idea for a version of Pandemic where you're fending off an alien invasion? Exactly. Something like that, but not terrible. Uh, Chaz, since you're here, would you mind sharing our first sponsor while I go think up my own million dollar alternate version game idea? Yeah, sure, Paula. Uh, hopefully you'll come up with a game idea as long lasting as Love Letter, which returns this month in its new variation, Star Wars Jabba's Palace, a love letter game from Z-Man Games. The home of the galaxy's most notorious gangster is a place of danger and deception. Its vile denizens thrive within, but the members of the Rebel Alliance have infiltrated it with plans of their own. Based on the beloved card game and set in the Star Wars galaxy, Star Wars Jabba's Palace A Love Letter Game retains the simple and fun mechanisms of the original, as two to six players utilize the talents of iconic characters from Return of the Jedi. In this quick card game of daring and deceit, players use the numbers and effects on their cards to eliminate the other players and accomplish their own secret agendas. Star Wars Jabba's Palace A Love Letter Game became available on February 11th at local and online toy and game retail stores across the galaxy. So follow the link in this video's description to find it now, because this game is sure to be hotter than a thermal detonator. <laughs> hmm. Um, y y you know, s since we're, I'm already here, we might as well just roll into my first pick of the month, Abstract Academy. At the Abstract Academy, the competition is fierce, as the students vie for top marks while putting their own spin on each assignment. The twist? The art school has limited supplies, so players must share a canvas with their rival classmates. Players play cards to build a 4x4 four four canvas, and once the canvas is filled, the two rows closest to each player forms their scoring zone. If the color patterns in one zone complete a scoring card better than the patterns in anyone else's zone, then they claim the scoring card. Additionally, bonus inspiration cards can be earned as well. Whoever has the most points after three rounds is the star pupil of Abstract Academy. And they win the game. Oh yeah, I'm often drawn to games in which the beneficial choices that players make will also benefit their opponents in some way, requiring players to find that balance between helping and hindering their score with every single action they take. And that's what caught my eye about Abstract Academy, as this game also looks like it may be a quick two to four player card game that requires finding that strategic balance based on where and how each player places their cards on the table. Our next pick this month is one of Rodney's recommendations, the roll and write game Dungeons Dice and Danger. That's right, adventurer. Gather your courage, pack your sword, and roll the dice on a journey through the realm in search of treasure, glory, and a waffle house that will still let you pay by check. I'm gonna find one. Players will explore deep, dark dungeons that are brimming with treasure and infested with monsters. Do you have what it takes to be a hero of legend? I'm hoping you do, but then I, I barely know you, so surprise me. Get this, we've got Richard Garfield, a Roland Wright, and Ravensburger. 
How could this game not be on my radar? It's like the three hours of gaming. And in this game, you'll be an adventurer going through dungeons and slaying stuff, which frankly is the one thing the heroes always seem to want to do in dungeons. So they really nailed the theme on this one. Now, I don't know a lot about this game, but from the pictures I've seen, it looks like there's quite a bit of variation between the different pages. And I'm hoping this means it might have the potential to tell more of a storyline than most roll and writes would. Gonshan Clever is great, but it doesn't exactly weave a rich narrative. I mean, maybe Gonshan Clever needs a rethemed version too, just like Patchwork had. Like, maybe a version where you're fending off an alien invasion. Exactly, something like that, but not terrible. How about incorporating some type of city building into the game? Ooh, that has potential. But you're not in this episode yet, Matthew, so we can't count that one. What if it's Gonshan Clever? Rethemed as an Arbor Day edition of Bosk. That's the one! Chaz! What's up? Make it happen! How? We're counting on you, Chaz. We're all counting on you. Okay. Descending from a long line of zookeepers, it's no wonder that Matthew chose Ark Nova as his cup of tea. I mean, how would you like to plan and design a modern, scientifically managed zoo? That's right, scientifically managed. Out are zoos founded on magic or hopeful wishes. These zoos are methodically tested using modern techniques, resulting in up to 14% less marsupial loss annually. The data proves it. Read the research. <laughs> well, I am. Way off script, so I'll work my way back by saying that in the game, players compete to own the most successful zoological establishment by building enclosures, accommodating their animals, and supporting conservation projects all over the world, even in Lansbury, Michigan. Ark Nova. Played it, loved it, named my pet goldfish after it. This is one of my picks for the game of the year. Replacing my old game of the year, which was just half a pack of cards I found in a laundrette parking lot. So yeah, I don't want to feed into the hype, but... I think the game really is that good. Working from the shadows, the mysterious organization, Mind Management, once used its psychically powered agents to prevent global crises and plant trees. However, as they say, absolute power corrupts absolutely, and Mind Management is now rotting from the inside, like a pinata left out in the rain. This is one of my personal picks, Mind Management, the Psychic Espionage Game, in which one player controls mind management and must scour the city for new recruits, while all other players control rogue agents who must try to stop the covert corporation before it's too late. They accomplish this by asking questions to the recruiter and deducing their whereabouts, and they can use dry erase mental notes to track all the information they're given. I picked this game because I really like games with deduction and hidden movement, and this one is based on a comic book series. So it's really visually interesting, on top of being fun to play and a real battle of wits between you and your opponents. I've played it multiple times digitally with Matthew and just got my hands on a physical copy and I cannot wait to try out the solo mode I just found out exists for the game. The only thing that would make it better would be designing a spin-off of the game based on the manipulative world of advertising instead of espionage. Uh, what do you think? Oh, hey, sorry. I'm on the line with the Bosk people. Oh, perfect. Ask them if they can add a single player solo mode too. Okay. I'll absolutely pretend that I'm going to remember to do that for you. Exciting. <sighs> Casting off the yoke of oppression this month is Rodney with his pick of Maki, a solitaire worker placement game with variable goals that plays in approximately 20 minutes. The player places their resistance agents on spaces around town to achieve their goals, such as blowing up trains or publishing underground newspapers. But at the same time, collaborators and soldiers patrol the area as well. As such, agents who don't make it back to their safe house by the end of the day are arrested, never to be seen again. I had bought the app version of this game, and it made for a tense, clever puzzle where I was continually balancing the need to push my luck for those big, important moves but at the same time having to play conservatively enough that I wasn't losing my forces unnecessarily. And when the publisher released a second edition of the physical copy of the game, I knew I had to buy it. So I did. And I had wrestled with a couple of the rules in the app and I was hoping that this version would make it clear. And they certainly were. 
I also did a Twitch stream where I taught and played through three games of this, if you'd like to check that out, over at twitch.tv slash watchitplayed. And of course, the app is still available too. An app! Chess, ask the Gonchon Clever people about making an app version of the Arbor Day version of the Bosque version of their game. Yes, that's right. Arbor Day! Yes, I am aware that the game is already about trees. Please hold. You know what? Maybe I can use this opportunity to mention the other sponsor that helped make this episode possible. Marvel gaming accessories, including Ghost Rider, Doctor Strange, Thwipping Spider-Man, and other new sleeves. The spirit of vengeance rolls in with this newest addition to the upper deck line of gaming accessories, featuring fan favorite Marvel superheroes and villains. This new collection of limited edition accessories can be used with any game, including, of course, the legendary deck building game and the Versus System 2 player card game. And this time, we're going to highlight the Ghost Rider Robbie Rise sleeves. This fiery, mystical street racer can perform incredible stunts, such as teleporting, riding across water, and protecting your card collection from dust, debris, and demons. The Ghost Rider, Rainbow Thor, and Spidey Thwip sleeves are limited edition exclusives available right now at UpperDeckStore.com. So follow the link in this video's description to find these and other Marvel gaming accessories on their website. It's a great way to pass the time while you're on hold. Oh, oh, I'm going to get that one. Another of Paula's personal picks this month is Mystic Veil Essential Edition, which comes in a box so big and packed with pieces that you'll have to sign a waiver of viability just to carry it out of the store. That's not true, but still, remember to lift with your legs and not your back. In Mystic Veil, two to four players represent druidic clans trying to lift a corrosive curse that has fallen upon the land. Each turn, cards are played to gain powerful advancements and useful Veil cards, generating not only power to provide additional points, but also decay that will end one's turn prematurely. John D. Clare is one of my favorite designers, but I had never played this classic game in his repertoire until very recently. I finally got a chance to check out this card crafting game through the very well implemented Steam app, and I loved it. I really enjoy deck building. It's a mechanism I just find very satisfying. And Mystic Veil gives it a little twist, so you can add attributes, powers, and scoring abilities to the cards you already have in your deck. And now, after finally getting a chance to play Mystic Veil, I can confidently proclaim that John D. Clare's spot as my top game designer remains secure. And John D. Clare is the head of the game variation game, having also produced Edge of Darkness, Custom Heroes, and Dead Reckoning, all of which utilize the unique card crafting system he introduced in Mystic Veil. Vale. That's quite an extensive list of games that include it, but I think there's still room for more. Hey, Chaz. If you're about to ask me to incorporate card crafting into this Gonshan Bosk clever monstrosity, I'm gonna cry. No, oh, that would be ridiculous. No. Oh. Thank goodness. No, just ask if they can have John D. Clare design it. So you, you want me to ask if our unauthorized edition, based on games that have already been created by two other people, can now somehow be retroactively designed by John D. Clare? Exactly. That's it. Good lad. Always one step ahead of me. Did I accidentally trigger a mummy's curse today or something? Our job takes us all over the world, but out of everywhere we've traveled, one place stands out as our favorite. Ancient Egypt. Exactly. Which is one of the reasons why Ankh, Gods of Egypt, is on our radar this month. And when we heard that this played well at two players and was a strategic area influence game, we knew we had to try it. Ankh, Gods of Egypt, invites players to step into the oversized novelty sandals of an ancient Egyptian god, competing to survive as society begins to forget the old ways until only they and their followers remain. Build caravans, summon monsters, and convert followers in order to reign supreme. All of the gameplay in Ankh, including combat, is streamlined and designed to be non-random. There's no fickle dice or unpredictable decks to foil one's omnipotent plans here. Instead, players must compete and win solely by their godly wits alone. Of course, cheating is always an option too. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. I'm being informed that cheating is never an option. Not in this, nor any other game. So I guess we're just back to winning by the strength of your wits. I, mean, I, I guess I could try winning by my wits alone. There's a first time for everything. I mean, who knows? Maybe we'll have an Arbor Day miracle. And then...
Reds, power of our brigade. Red flag over Paris, the spiritual successor to Mark Herman's political war game, Fort Sumter, is a short yet challenging two-player card-driven game depicting the two months of intense confrontation between rebels and the government in Versailles during the 1871 Paris Commune. You know what's difficult to say? Between rebels. Between webbles. <laughs> anyway, this is also a game that was unknowingly selected by both Matthew and Rodney. In Red Flag Over Paris, players must not only fight for control of the city, but will also need to win the heart and minds of the French population. And to represent this, the board is divided into two areas, military and political, which are themselves divided into several subsections. As such, the game forces players to make tough decisions, like when to focus on political influence or military dominance, and how to optimise limited resources, such as religious influence or the court of public opinion, which is all I traffic court, except I usually show up to that one, so. In addition to controlling military and political spaces and fulfilling the objectives to score victory points, players will have to manage their momentum as well. This culminates in a final crisis where, after up to three rounds, each player will have to play all the cards they'd set aside earlier in the game as their last opportunity to place influence before determining the winner, building up to a sort of tense last-ditch effort to claim victory. This is an entry-level card-driven game that I think can help draw a lot of new players into card-driven war games. Plus, it looks wonderful, and I'm looking forward to playing it, actually, during my house arrest for all those unpaid parking tickets. I think that was a way that I could have played my case. It's so unfair. It's ridiculous. Defending its place on our list is Defense of Procyon 3, a highly asymmetric game of four players in two teams, selected not only by Monique and Naveen, but Chaz as well. In this game, one player takes charge of the alien space navy, with their partner leading the alien ground forces, while the other team of the human space and ground forces stand in their way. The action spans two game boards, a hex board for the entanglement taking place in orbit, while a ground board manages a point-to-point -point network of locations. Chaz, what led you to pick this game? If you're calling to license gone, Sean Clever is a holiday-themed app version of another game. Press 7. Please hold. <laughs> well, I assume Chaz was going to mention how each side's two commanders must work together closely to make sure there are no weaknesses for the enemy to exploit, and how the differing mechanisms of their individual theaters ensure that each player has their own responsibilities to manage in their march towards victory. Is that right, Chaz? Please continue holding. You are number three in line. Your estimated wait time is until tomorrow. This is hands down one of the best games we played in 2021. It's an extremely immersive experience. And when we play, we pretend that the alien space navy is on Procyon 3 trying to plant trees. Reforestation on an alien world is still reforestation. It's an Arbor Day celebration any day of the year. Happy, Happy Arbor, Arbor Day! Day. State the name of the board game you would like John D. Clare to develop a single-player app based on a holiday-themed adaptation of Gone Sean Clever for... Bosk. I heard Boss Monster. Is that right? Ah, uh, no, Bosk. I heard Ark Nova. Is that right? Uh, no, I'm saying Bosk. I heard I'm the boss. Is that right? Bosk. Bus Boss? Bosk. Dengar? Bosk. Architects of the West Kingdom? No! Bosk? Yes, Bosk. That license is unavailable. Goodbye. And that's the power of our brigade.